We're talking with Jacob Sager Weinstein, who has written for The Onion, The New Yorker, McSweeney's, and he is the author of a brand new book that I cannot recommend enough called How Not to Kill Your Baby, The Revolutionary New Way to Raise Perfect Children, Get Them into a Good Med School, Keep Them Safe from Ever Being Sad About Anything, and Who Are We Kidding? It's a Parody. Please welcome comedy writer extraordinaire Jacob Sager Weinstein. Hello, Jacob. Uh, Hey, David. Thanks for having me on. Now, we are talking via Skype. You are in London. I I am indeed. The the posh Oxbridge accent, I'm sure, was a dead giveaway. Yes, and you are living and working in London. You are living my dream, and not just because your wife is beautiful. You have two kids, too, right? Yes, that's right. I do, absolutely. Or or as I call them, tax write-offs for whatever I make on this book. And you've had these two children, and you decided to write a book advising parents how not to kill their baby. <laughs> that's right, exactly. You know, I've, I've always had this theory that the uh, you should either, if you're doing anything, you should either read no books about it, or like a dozen books, because if you just read one, you will believe that that is the only way to do it. Um, actually, when I was become, trying to become a screenwriter, I read a whole bunch of screenwriting books. And so when my wife was pregnant, I read, you know, a dozen different parenting books. And you, you sort of start to realize there are certain kinds of insanity that are common to each one and certain kinds of insanity that are unique to each one. This book was, re- was written as sort of a, a satire of, of the the sort of stupidities that I found in my research. Well, you were also angry, and all great comedy writing comes from rage and despair. You're, well, you, 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 you said a- that, you know, that's something you, I actually thought about that while I was writing this book, because, you know, we used to work together, on, and that's something you said to me early on, that all comedy comes from anger. And I, I actually, I don't agree with that. I think that's, that's not always true, but this was the first thing that I wrote that really did come from anger. And what made you angry? Well, I, I feel like you're, you are so vulnerable uh, when you have children, especially your first child, and there's this whole industry that is built up to exploit that, that terror and vulnerability you feel for, for profit. Um, so there's books that are, are written with the subtext of, if you don't buy this book, your baby will die or, or, or not get into Harvard, which is just as bad. If you don't buy this product, your baby will suffer a concussion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it just makes me angry. I think there's, there's certainly some books that are, or, and some products that are made with genuine good intentions and are really helpful for parents, but a lot of it really seems exploitative. And that, that kind of pissed me off. Give me an example of what set you off. Okay. Well, so one of the things I read was a book called Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child, often recommended. Uh, a lot of parents recommended it to me. And two things sort of made me angry about it. First of all, it's just badly written. It's like hard to understand what the author is saying half the time. And if you're sleep deprived, it, it, it might as well be random words. Um, what really makes me angry with hindsight is this. And I'll tell you why I say hindsight in a moment. It's he has certain very dogmatic principles about sleep. So for example, he says, it doesn't count if your baby sleeps in the baby carriage or in the car. Not just, you know, it's a bad habit, try to get them to sleep at home. It doesn't count. He actually has something in his book, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says if you're, ba- if you're out and your baby falls asleep in the carriage, then just tell yourself, well, I failed this time. Next time I'll do better. So, but at the time, you know, I'm the youngest kid. I've never been around babies. Um, this, is, this, is, this was our first. So for all I know, this is true. This is a sleep expert. I should, I should believe him. So I sort of talk, was talking to my wife about that. I read that passage. She is the oldest of four children. She's actually experienced real life babies. So just, she just sort of rolled her eyes and told me that was not going to happen, that the baby was going to sleep in the car, the baby was going to sleep in the carriage. So sort of now that I've had two kids and I realize just how harmful and terrifying and misguided that advice is, I'm retroactively really angry, angry that he gave it, but even more angry that I actually sort of believed it for a little while. And this is for the benefit of the parents and not the baby. The, the, the advice he's giving? or Yeah, sleep deprivation is really about having working parents who need the baby to sleep around their schedule, not the baby's schedule. <laughs> well, that is that is a subtext you sometimes get. Um, and I sort of, you know, one of the things, by the way, the thing that angers me most of all of my whole parenting experience is something that does not come from books. It's when you tell an experienced parent that you're having a hard time sleeping and they sort of chuckle and they say, oh, you'll never get a good night's sleep again. Because like they have clearly forgotten what those first six months are like, where you know there's like there's like one level of sleep deprivation where it's not safe for you to drive, and there's even a level beyond that where it's not safe for your baby to go to the Hague because that level of sleep deprivation is a war crime and he will be prosecuted for it. And I think parents sometimes forget that by the time your baby is like five, 
you know, he's waking you up at six in the morning, but he's sleeping through the night. But but when it's Guantanamo style sleep deprivation, it's just another matter entirely. Right, right. It is incredible not to trivialize people who actually do do damage to their kids, but it's amazing the number of people who don't do damage to their kids. Yes. It really yes. is. It does speak. When, whenever I get cynical about humanity, I think of all the people who put up with so much crap from a newborn baby. And yes. there is something really beautiful and encouraging about our species because we, we don't kill our babies. We, we, we put up with a lot from babies that if it were another human being in our home, we would probably kill them. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I lived with my wife for many years before we had children. And if she had, you know, woken me up in the, at three in the morning and then pooped on me, it would have been the end of our relationship. That's not why I heard about you, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I, I, there, there are advice books that I think have the right spirit. Famously, uh, Benjamin Spock starts off his book with, you know more than you think you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great message to send to parents. But I think a lot of a lot of books are... I know more than you think you do. Give me money. Yeah, I mean, people have been raising babies for, I don't know, a couple million years without yes. reading a book about it. Now, it's, it's important to note that, that, that most babies who have ever been born, or at least who are, who are born for most of history before my book came along, are no longer alive. That's true. So, so you know, I mean, I think there is something to be said that, that had the Middle Ages had my book and other like it, people might still be alive thousands of years later. So your book is a parody and you're selling fake items to the reader, how not to kill the baby. There's, you have a baby seat with uh, a, that has a bend greblet. What's a bend greblet? Well, well, one thing I should say, the book is, is lavishly illustrated. Uh, it is. Um, that's an illustration of, actually, that's not a product I'm selling. I'm sort of advising you on how to do that. Well, you know, a memory I have is when, when my daughter was born, my wife is standing there holding her. The baby's crying. I'm trying to fit her into fit the car seat into the back seat of a taxi cab, uh, and it was just this incredibly stressful thing. So in the book, I talk about how you know, don't worry, it's it's not as stressful as it seems, and I've got sort of a simple process for installing the the child seat, which I can tell you, it's very simple. You adjust the height so the baby's head rests in the proper place. You tighten the straps, but do not tighten the straps. You do rotate the omelet. You tilt it so the baby's at the angle. You bend the greblet. Uh, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere only, you rotate the from it, and then you feldspar the mizzen mast. And, and then you're set. Um, <laughs> and then, then the other thing is, I, on the following page, I then have exactly the same instructions to, to help women breastfeed. Which a man should always be the one who advises a woman on how to breastfeed. Yes, and, 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 and if possible, I would say based on my research, not only should a man advise women, he should do so in the most condescending uh, and insulting terms possible. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Daryl Issa. And how <laughs> should a woman breastfeed? Well, you know, that seem, may seem intimidating, but it's actually, it's very simple. What you do is uh, you bend the greblet, you feldspar the mizzen mast, you adjust the height so the baby's head rests here, you tilt them at a 45 degree angle and a counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere only, uh, and then you rotate the from and then you're set. I see. Now that's interesting because I'm a man. I'm a man, and that makes me feel stupid. So imagine <laughs> how a woman must feel hearing that. Yes. And, and that's only, by the way, this is this is saying how to breastfeed. This is not even getting into the question of how long do you breastfeed? Do you breastfeed? You know, do you stop before the kid goes to college, after grad school? It's that in itself is a whole source of anxiety. And because it's a source of anxiety, it's a source of potential profit uh, for various expert selling books. How happy should a kid be when they're growing up? <laughs> well, it depends if they have me. I'm the best dad ever. So mm -hmm. I'd say limitlessly. But for an ordinary schlub, I think I think they're going to be miserable sometimes. And I think that that part of what these books are selling is this idea of perfection, that if you do things right, your kid will always be perfectly happy, which which is nice. But the, the, the flip side of that is that if you if your kid is ever unhappy, it's because you've screwed up. Mm hmm. Toilet training. Yes. Have you mastered it yet? Uh, I, I have. I, I put my wee in the potty every time. I'm very proud of that. Oh, you mean for my kids? Yes. What is the secret to toilet training? Okay. Well, um, you know, one thing that I think is very important when you're using words to sort of talk about your kids' private parts, you have to speak sort of very casually with no tension because kids can sense tension. And if, if they sense you're sort of tense when you're talking about their genitals, they'll think there's something dirty or shameful and they'll withhold and they'll be constipated. So for God's sake, whatever you do, do not get stressed when you're discussing toilet training because you, you, can, you can screw them up forever if you are too stressed. So just relax. It's okay. Don't think about all that can go wrong. <laughs> 
what is the a, like, what is the age at which a person should finish their toilet training? Well, it, it's like chess. It can take minutes to learn, but a lifetime to master. <laughs> I, I sat down the other day and I, I used the Greblitz opening to, to and I and, and I, I, it went disastrously. I should have known. In a public urinal, you never use the Greblitz. I it's just a, a classic rookie error. What is the relationship between? Is, is the father necessary? No, absolutely not. I mean, I I I I from reading various books, I know that 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 evolution has ensured that the mother is a warm, nurturing presence, unless she goes back to work, in which case she, she's she's evil incarnate. And and the father is basically a penis with legs. He's absolutely useless. Men can't nurture. Um, men basically would drop the baby on its head, left to their own devices. The one thing I've learned from these books is that if you speak to dads with lots of sports metaphor, then you can maybe get it through their thick skull how to actually take care of the baby. So actually what, what I did is I, I painted football lines on my baby so I know to hold her tight and not let gravity, which was the opposing lineman, knock her out of my arms. And mm-hmm. then I got it. Should the father be in the delivery room? And if so, what should a father know about birth and seeing the baby born? The father should definitely be in the delivery room. If possible, he should be wearing blindfolds and earplugs. If it's not possible and if he actually has to witness the miracle of life, I, I think the important thing for him to do is to be there to encourage the woman and especially to tell the woman to push. If you didn't tell the woman to push and, and the only motivation she had was another human being inside her uterus, then, then she would just sit there and do nothing. So what she really needs is somebody who actually does not have a uterus yelling in her ear to push. That, that I highly recommend that technique. I think you're absolutely right because I was yep. in the delivery room and I think my wife would not have known to push if I didn't, uh, and to breathe also. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You. I mean, you would not be surprised. This is why. This is why single motherhood is a problem because women women suffocate to death if the guy is not there to say breathe. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry. Hold on a minute. Honey, breathe. <laughs> the, the kid is four years old now, but I just you just can't be too careful. Now, what about pets? Because I always view children as pets. If you already have a human pet. Do you need another species in your house as a pet? Well, this is actually a really interesting scientific question because uh, on the one hand, there's some evidence that early exposure to pets will help prevent allergies later in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, On the other hand, there's evidence that early exposure to pets will cause allergies later in life. So the key is to have a pet and not have a pet at the same time. Um, actually, one of the products I sell is the official How Not to Kill Your Baby's Schrodinger's Cat in a Box, which is simultaneously alive and dead at the same time. Uh, therefore, it takes care of both sides. I- I'm going to buy that. Now, now, do check your homeowner's insurance because sometimes it's invalidated by the presence of quantum paradoxes in the nursery. Mm-hmm. But uh, as long as it's not, you're good to go.